And I'd just like to say that we and Morgan Stanley have been overwhelmed by the amount of support and interest in this evening's event. Um, I'd like to firstly give a, a huge thanks to Bjorn for giving up his time. Over the course of the next two days, um, he's going to be presenting his lecture to probably close to 800 people between Glasgow and Edinburgh, which must make it one of the biggest tech events that I can remember recently in, in Scotland. Um, it's fascinating to see the spread of people in the audience. We have everything from people who have managed to find out about the event who are still at school, um, through academia, students, and I think there must be about um, 50 different Scottish technology companies with representation here. So a bit of housekeeping from me first off. Can everybody make sure that their mobile devices are on silent? There aren't any fire drills planned for this evening. So if the fire alarm goes off, the exits are at each side at the front of the auditorium. Once we go across the road, we'd, we'd love you all to come across and join us for some drinks, nibbles, and a bit of networking um, across in the informatics forum, right across the other side of the square. And again, the fire doors, there's one on each wall there, um, but for any disabled guests, either go out the back wall or out the main front entrance. In terms of people I'd like to thank, firstly, my own team, I'd like to say a massive thanks to Rebecca Hastings and Joe Frawley, who have managed to pull together these events in just a couple of weeks. I'd also like to thank Khaled Rafiq and his team from Morgan Stanley in Scotland um, for all their support in making this, this happen, and thank Professor Dave Robertson and the Edinburgh University School of Informatics as well for their support. After the event, when we go across for the drinks and canopies, you'll see that there is a pop-up there from Bite Night, which I'd like to take one minute to promote. It's the IT industry's annual charity event to raise money for Action for Children. It's a sleep out that we do in October in Holyrood Park. We're aiming to get at least 200 um, technologists to sleep out this year. And last year, we raised over £100,000 in one night and it's to help prevent the causes of youth homelessness. So there's 500 people here tonight. If I can try and persuade even a fraction of you to go and speak to them and find out a bit more, that would be fantastic. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome um, Phil Carter, who's one of the managing directors for technology at Morgan Stanley. Hi there. Um, just checking you can hear me. Do I need to use the mic? No, no, that's good. Um, so my name is Phil Carter. I'm, um, I work in uh, Morgan Stanley. Um, so I run the uh, equity trading systems um, uh, here in Europe and focus a lot on derivatives technology and so on and so forth. I hope that you watched every single slide out of the 160 slides that went up there um, whilst you were waiting for the lecture to start. Um, so I won't have to tell you much about what we do. But um, anyway, the, I don't want to stand between you and Bjorn getting started. I'm looking forward to his lecture too. Um, I started my career very much um, working as a C programmer, trying to convince my managers at the time were a big Fortran pro programmers, not only to move to C, but to move to C++. Um, and that was about 20 years ago. And I, I, I succeeded in doing that. So I'm, I'm quite pleased. And that was a, one of my biggest um, uh, achievements in life, I think. Um, anyway, the, to tell you a little bit about um, Morgan Stanley, who um, you know, we have the great privilege of having Bian to join us. And I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about us. The, um, just briefly, I think, you know, before I got into investment banking technology, I worked in the defense industry and I didn't have a clue what those kind of bean counters did. So, um, but now I've been in that industry for uh, 15 to 20 years now. The, um, you know, the way I think of it more and more over that two decades is, is very, very simple. Um, you know, if you think, now, I think of the firms like Google, which is essentially, in my view, an advertising company where the technology is really fundamental to that business. Um, you could say that for many, many other firms. LinkedIn, really a recruiting agency, with technology being fundamental. 
Well, more and more, I see what we do as being the, exactly the same thing. And I think, you know, maybe the cynics would say, well, of course you'd say that. Um, but r really, you know, I, I can say that with my hand on my heart because um, we really couldn't run our business without it. We don't run technology to support our business. We run it because it's fundamental to our business. Um, and, you know, one of the things we're very proud of is that, um, in, in, for example, the area that I work in, we're number one in equity trading in the world and here in Europe. And that is, um, you know, a big part of that is because we like to think we build um, far superior technology than our competitors. So we spend a lot of time um, trying to attract the best talents that we can attract around the world. Um, we also try and do the best we can to nurture the talent that we have. Um, and they include languages such as C, C++, where we invest heavily in that, but also in other languages, um, and Bian will kill me afterwards, but you know, other languages like Java, more recently Scala, um, and uh, many, many other things. So um, you know, we've recently uh, built a new team, building some of our most sophisticated platforms in, in Glasgow. So we just, uh, I, I was just told we, we've now hit the 100 mark you know, so we have 100 programmers up in, um, up in Glasgow working on these systems alongside three or four other key development centers we, we, we have um, in the world, including um, uh, Budapest here in Europe, and in Asia we have Shanghai and, and uh, Montreal in the Americas. So you know, we, we really look for, and I personally, and I've been working um, with, with teams here in, in, in Scotland and in Glasgow in particular, for the last 15 years, and I've never had any problem attracting great talent. So with that, I'm you know, very pleased to come here with uh, a great like Bian and um, you know, be part of a lecture like this. So I'm looking forward to sitting down there and, uh, uh, and, and listening to the lecture. So um, thank you very much, and hope you enjoy the lecture as I'm sure I will. Right. So, um, welcome, um, and, and first of all, I, I don't go around killing people, um, and as a matter of fact, I don't think you can be a professional in the computing industry knowing just one language. So if, if, if you actually want to be in the field, uh, you, should, you should learn uh, at least two, preferably five, uh, maybe a few more. Uh, but to, today, I, I will, of course, talk about C++. And I'm, I'm going to try and, and see what's sort of special, what's essential to, to C++. And I'm not trying to, to drill down and, and write uh, and give you a, a really advanced, uh, deep technical talk. I'm trying to get some of the key ideas across with a simple presentation as I can get it. And I'm going to use examples for a long time uh, scale because I think it is important that systems live for a long time. Uh, software tend to live uh, quite a lot longer than hardware. And um, people have this notion that you get a language, right? The designer figures it out and it's all there tomorrow. It's not. It takes about 10 years from inception to uh, serious industrial use, and then it takes more decades for uh, everything to get done. So that's what I'm going to do. There are some pictures here. They all have something to do with C++, except for a few that obviously has nothing to do with anything. They're just landscapes and such. They are for me to calm down, take a deep breath, and remember I'm going to shift the topic. But uh, the ones that, that appears to illustrate something, probably has something to do with uh, C++. That happens to be the tunnel of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And um, one of the things I really like about programming languages, about IT, is it is a perfect excuse for sticking your nose into interesting projects in just about any field. And so if you're interested in high energy physics and the structure of the universe, uh, being a programmer is one of the best ways of getting there. It's uh, probably easier than becoming a theoretical physicist. Uh, OK, so I'm going to first talk a little bit about uh, what C++ is and what it's supposed to be and uh, 
how, how, how we are getting there. And then I'm going to go through some practical details. I'm very interested in resource management, mostly because I'm into systems programming and building complex systems where resources has to be dealt with, dealing with object-oriented programming, class hierarchies, which I assume most of you have seen. Then I'm going to get into a bit of uh, template programming, generic programming with templates. And then I'm going to point out that, you know, this, this is a real world language with real world problems. We can do better still. Um, so uh, I, I listen in to uh, discussions in, 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 in real life and on the, the web. And it seems that often I'm the only one around who doesn't have a firm opinion about what C++ is. Um, here, here we see the uh, blind men and the elephant. And if all you've seen is sort of the tail, you have some, some firm idea of what the elephant is like, except it's only right for the tail. So everything we see here is, is probably true for somebody at some time in some place and if you think that's the whole story, you're wrong. And so my problem is I actually know the beast. And it's a little bit harder to generalize what, what the beast is when you have to take it all into account. So I'm trying to, to, to explain a little bit about the beast here, about that elephant. So let's go back and see what I, I, I would like. What I'd like when I started C++, what I uh, have learned over the years that I want. Uh, type safety is, is a, a really important aspect. And um, when I started out, uh, a C program couldn't check the types of its, its uh, function arguments. There was no function prototypes. There was no function declarations that specified the types. And this was actually fairly controversial at the time. People said, well, you know, if, if, if you have a declaration of type, then when I look at my call, I do not know what it's doing because it depends on something I can't see. I'd much rather have it just like an assembly code. I just do something and I don't have to look anywhere else. Okay, so I have actually been trying to increase the type safety of the C, C++ family of languages since uh, day one. And uh, that's not all that easy because it's under constraints of size of programs, performance of programs and such. Uh, resource safety, I, I really don't want to leak things. If you are writing um, code for, for, say, a spaceship, uh, you, you should not run out of resources. The resources can be just about anything, but I think about things like memory, file handles, communication connections, uh, locks, uh, things like that. Performance, my, my, my business, by and large, self-chosen, is to be able to, among other things, uh, run as fast as possible uh, close to the hardware. Some language has to be able to implement a memory manager and a virtual machine and things like that. And C++, more or less by definition, is that. That's the aim. Predictability. If you get into uh, hard real time, uh, you really have to have every operation be executed in a predictable time, usually a low uh, constant maximum time. And operations that can't do that are just simply not allowed on planes after um, they take off. I'm not talking about the entertainment system, of course. I'm talking about the engine controls and the things that deals with the flipping of the wings. Um, and C++ follows that rule roughly, except for the use of free store dynamic memory, which is not allowed there anyway, and you have to do something else. Uh, teachability, it really should be possible to teach how to do this kind of stuff, how to, how to use something. You can't just um, assume people will want to learn something. You have to make it reasonably easy, and the complexity of the code should be proportional to the complexity of the task you're doing. That is a very big statement, very hard to do. It's an ideal. It's something you can try and approach. And in different domains, you can get closer than others. But it's definitely what I would like to see. And I would like to have the code be readable by humans and machines. 
Again, those of you who know C++ knows that this is just an ideal because you can write really ugly code in C++. As a matter of fact, you can write really ugly code in, in any language, but this is C++ I'm concerned about. You, it should be possible to write really nice readable code, and you can. Um, and I want it for systems programming, embedded systems, resource constraint systems, and for large systems. Uh, that's the sort of the domain I'm most interested in. Um, it is not optimized for, for writing simple web apps, for instance. It's not. It's not meant to be the simplest programming language on Earth. It's supposed to be the simplest we can get for real-world constrained applications. Uh, C++ is, is, is expert-friendly. It's uh, very expert-friendly. I uh, coined the phrase to point out that that's not enough. If it's only expert-friendly and it's hostile to new users, to novices, to casual users, uh, we're not helping a lot of people that could be helped. So it has to be novice-friendly, too. Uh, that, that's an important thing. Uh, and I'll show you some code that makes this statement plausible. Um, C++ comes from uh, two traditions in programming languages, and quite consciously so. Here is uh, this line here, which is deliberately uh, towards the low end. This is sort of close to optimal exploitation of the hardware. Uh, very abil the ability to manipulate anything you have in hardware and, um, and do it well. So we started with assembler. We've got languages by BC, PL, and C. Uh, C is still around. Um, this is uh, Dennis Ritchie, and his genius was actually to define a model of hardware that was sort of general and could be used. I mean, if you add something, you use the add instruction. If you access memory, memory are sequences of objects. When you want to compose something out of uh, other objects, you just put them next to each other. You stack things of the same type next to each other, and you get arrays. You stack things of different types on each other, and you get structs. Uh, that's a very nice memory model. It has stood the test of time very well. However, this is low-level stuff. Um, I don't really like programming with bits and bytes and addresses and things like that. We, we, we need something that uh, is, is more fit for humans. And, and here we have Backus, who invented Fortran. Fortran was a language designed for a very particular kind of humans engineers and scientists. And um, it was the first language to lift the uh, level of programming from being focused on the machine to being focused on the problem. It was the first language that really was fit for humans. And once that was done, um, we actually got portability. I mean, Fortran was designed so that IBM could sell more machines. And it, it turned out that after Fortran, you could take these programs and with fairly minor changes, move them to, uh, say, a Univac, which was a main competitor at the time. And that was, I believe, an unintentional effect, but it was very good for us. And lifting things up to a human level is, is a good idea. However, as I pointed out, scientists and engineers are very peculiar subspecies. And um, so every, once they had it, their own language, everybody else wanted one too, COBOL being the most pro, um, uh, prominent for, for business. But basically, very soon, we had um, about a couple of hundred languages. And the problem was they couldn't talk to each other. I mean, when you write something in COBOL, you can do really nice record and file manipulation. That was what it was for. That was what the business people wanted. It could add and subtract, but anything more sophisticated than that, it was not very good at. Fortran could, was really good at linear algebra for computations, could handle floating point numbers. Now, what do I do if I, as a scientist, wants to read some records, manipulate them, and compute on the result? The answer roughly was, you're out of luck. And um, there was many, many solutions to this, but the breakthrough, I think, was this. This is... Uh, with the language Simula, and said, why, why don't you let people build their own abstractions? Instead of building in um, matrices and records and things like that, why don't you just say, 
give people the language facilities for building their own uh, abstractions into the language. So if you want a vector, you build a vector. If you want a 3D matrix, you build a 3D matrix. And if you have a record, you build a record. That's where the class, is, uh, class uh, concept came in. And uh, they used uh, hierarchies of classes to represent related concepts. Some concepts are uh, uh, hierarchically oriented, not all. And uh, basically, you got what's currently known as object-oriented programming languages with classes and class hierarchies. And um, I, I found myself in a project a long time ago at Bell Labs where I needed to manipulate the lower levels of the hardware, write memory managers, write uh, uh, network drivers. But I also needed to construct something that had a fairly high complexity of organization. I wanted to be able to say, this bit here runs there, this bit there runs there. No, I changed my mind. This bit here should move over there. It was a distributed system. Languages at the time that could do the hard, uh, close to the hardware programming, could not say what a bit was. It was sort of a ball of code. It was, there was no, no serious abstraction there. And so I took the similar class concept and built, built it into C. And uh, some of the terminology uh, comes from Simula, and has later been inherited by lots of other languages. And uh, this happened in 1980, and we've been going on for a while since. Uh, we have a new standard there in 11. We're going to get a new one uh, this year. Um, it's, it's all the technical work is being done. It's, it's going through voting procedures under the ISO. So. Um, if you want to explain what C++ is, it's from this idea of taking the C and taking Simula and uh, putting them together. So we want a direct map from hard to hardware between the instructions and data types in C++ coming initially from C. And we want zero overhead abstraction, the ability to take these things, wrap them into uh, new types with data representation and uh, um, and and, uh, and set of operations or uh, interfaces defined and then being implemented later. Initially from Simula, uh, one of the really key things that came in very, very early in the C++ um, uh, development, very early being like the third week or thereabouts, constructors and destructors, because if you want to build your own abstractions and you want objects of them, very often the... Um, the object needs to be initialized, and if it holds something that needs to be cleaned up, you need to call a destructor to do it. And so uh, a lot of it came in here as the advance uh, in, in understanding and the number of uh, abstract kind of abstractions we're dealing with uh, could, could be done. And basically much of the, uh, of the inspiration at the time uh, came from operating systems. Uh, my, my background is in operating systems and microprogramming, machine architecture and such. That, that explains a lot for good and bad. Um, and basically, I've been wondering this question, what does C++ want to be what, uh, when, when it grows up? And the answer is, wants to be better at that. That is C++'s domain. If you are in a different domain, you will probably want different languages. And one thing that people point out is that there's a lot of old crud in C++. It's like a ship that's been at sea for a long time. It has acquired barnacles and such. And we would all like to get rid of them, but we can't. Because long-term stability, compatibility is a feature. People say, we want all of these new great things, but we do not want you to break our code. Um, this problem will probably be addressed in the future through code analysis and code transformation. I hope we'll see more of that. But basically, uh, remember this one. Uh, if you want C++ to be different and better, um, the next question is, can I break your code? And I think I know the answer, uh, at least for people with large code bases that's, that's important as opposed to a hobbyist. And so here's my version of the elephant. It's a language designed uh, for building uh, basically um, efficient and elegant abstractions uh, for areas like software infrastructure, resource constraint uh, applications. 
Okay, so this is one of these pictures that are there to get me to stop, take a deep breath, think. Now comes a new topic, which is resource management. How do we uh, deal with, with, with resources? Um, basically, a resource is something that you have to acquire, and then when you're finished with it, you have to give it back to wherever you got it from. And uh, this can be explicit, it can be implicit, but a re that's the definition of a resource. The example is, manage, is, is, is memory, give me some memory, I have to give it back, otherwise we have a memory leak. Um, it's a file handle, give me, open the file, close the file, get a lock, acquire the lock, release the lock. Open a socket connection, close the socket connection, things like that. And uh, we, we, we don't want leaks, we, we really don't want the, 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 the space probe to, to run out of, of anything. Uh, we don't want uh, our, uh, say, say, cell phones to, to crash once a day because it runs out of anything but electricity. We can't actually handle battery life uh, like this, except, of course, if we run more efficiently, we'll use less battery, but that's a different issue. Um, and usually, a, I mean, a resource should have an owner because otherwise it's, it's really hard to know who's responsible for um, giving back resources. Uh, the fact that um, there's no obvious representation of an owner in a, in a language like C or in C style C++ is why these programs tend to leak. Um, say I make myself a shape that's up on the screen and I get a pointer to that shape. Who is responsible for uh, getting the screen off, the, getting the shape off the screen again? Is it the screen manager or is it me? Okay. Then I give the pointer to the shape to him. Is it now his job or is it mine? That is a source of a lot of problems in, in C-style programming. We need to deal with that. So basically, the rule is there should be an owner that's often a handle like this that points to uh, the, the real um, resource, the real object. And uh, the, basically, the handle should represent something meaningful. It could be a vector, it could be a, 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 a pointer to something, could, could be just about anything. Okay, so uh, in the C++ standard, th there's actually a lot of things that behaves like that. You see all the sort of the main data structures, vectors, strings, maps, hash tables, and such, all follow this model. Uh, and so whenever you have one of these, it's a local object, and it points to something that it manages over on the side. And uh, when it goes away, goes out of scope, it cleans up its mess after it. And it's not just uh, memory, threads, logs, files, uh, file streams, and shared pointers are in this category. So th this is all over the current C++ standard. And basically, they all sort of more or less look like this. Uh, here is an abstraction, which is a vector of t's, and so you can initialize it in some way. All the interesting classes have some way of initializing them. In this place of case, you can give it an initializer list of t's. An initializer list of t's is sort of a list of things in curly braces. So uh, here, I'm saying that if you want to make a vector, you have to give me an initializer list. It will then make a list, and it will actually represent it some way. It will set aside some memory. It will put the elements of the list into that um, vector, into, into that memory. It keeps track of how many, things they, uh, how many things it's got, how many elements it's got. That's about the simplest you can do. And now you can make a vector of doubles and initialize it, a vector of strings and initialize it. And the important thing here is that when they go out of scope, the whole thing gets cleared up. Notice this is not, not the simplest of memory management, at least vector of strings. Strings are themselves handled. So to clean up that vector of strings, I have to tell the vector to clean itself up, and the vector has to tell all its strings to clean themselves up. And we could do com more complicated things like that, having a vector of records with locks. Uh, associated with them, things like that. But anyway, it's a very simple model. You can create things and you clean up your mess when you're finished. The cleanup is implicit. And so here is a, a, a sort of a classical example. Uh, you find it all over 
million line code bases, and it's a mess. Let's see what's wrong here. I want a gadget, and um, say, say I'm a Java programmer or a C++ programmer that still thinks it's cool to write code like in the, in the 90s. I make myself a gadget, and I assign that, uh, uh, that to a pointer, the pointer I get back. And um, there's a lot of code like that. The point here is I, didn't, I won't tell you what's in the gadget. But there could be all kinds of interesting things. Think it has a file handle, for instance. Uh, it opens a file or something. So here I do some code that might throw an exception. I do something that might return. And then I delete things. And all good Java programmers will complain that um, they, 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 they has to write the delete. That's such a pain in the neck. And we know that if you actually have to write such code, you'll get it wrong a fair amount of time. Uh, as a matter of fact, my rule these days is if I see a new, I know I have to write a delete somewhere, therefore I'll get it wrong, therefore I shouldn't write the new. But let's see. Uh, a garbage collector could be an idea. You just take away this one and everything will work, except that we don't know what's inside the gadget. It may hold things that uh, needs to be cleaned up, so we won't do that. So... Um, then the naked pointer is a problem also. If I throw an exception, I have leaked the gadget. If I return, I have leaked the gadget. This is actually not good code. So we can do something like this. Uh, this is fairly modern C++. It's been, been used heavily for the last sort of 15, 20 years in places. We have a shared pointer. I'm here using a C++ uh, 13 uh, notation for it. It says, make me a gadget and return a shared pointer to me. A shared pointer is, is sort of a simple implementation of garbage collection. Uh, the first garbage collectors were, co were uh, counter pointer things, and several languages call it garbage collection to this day. The point here being that if I throw an exception, the destructor for that shared pointer there uh, fires and cleans up the mess. Similarly, if I return, the mess is cleaned up. My code gets simpler. There's no delete down there. The, whenever we get out, it gets cleaned up. Fine. Constructors and destructors uh, handle this problem. Th there's only one problem left is I'm not sharing anything. That gadget is mine, all mine. So why do I need to do things like a, a use count to, keep, to, to count the number of users of, um, of, of the gadget? I know the number of users, it's me, one. So we can simplify that if we want. We can make a unique pointer to a gadget and everything works uh, simple. It's simple and cheap. Uh, one of the problems with uh, shared pointers is that they have to maintain a use count. A use count is a shared resource. It's shared between all users of the pointer. And so when you make more pointers to that uh, shared object, the use count goes up, one, two, three, two, two. When it gets to zero, the last guy out cleans up. It still cleans up everything, and we, we don't have any leaks of uh, file handles and such. But it, it still, if there's nothing shared, I shouldn't introduce a shared resource. We are in a world where lots of forms of concurrency happens, and anything shared costs more than you imagine it does. So this is better. But you know, I own that gadget, why am I dealing with pointers? I should have just done it simply in the first place. There are no need for any pointers here. I just make my gadget, and uh, the destructor of a gadget gets thrown. If we get out of here, we can get out here. We can get out here. We can get out here. Doesn't matter. Destructor is called, clean up so reception, uh, the exceptions, and that is good. And basically, we have reached the point where the code looks simpler, and there, there are no pointers. There are some behind the scene, but it's easy to write a, a constructor and a destructor pair that takes care of, of resources. So this is good. And um, this, this, this is known by the amazing phrase, resource acquisition is initialization, which I consider the proof that I shouldn't be in marketing. And uh, basically, it just does what we said. And it happens to be a good way of dealing with a system that uses exceptions, and exceptions is the best way of dealing with error handling because it will give the right thing 
uh, uh, right happen, things had to happen, especially when you have destructors to help you clean out local resources. And so we can write leak-free code. And in general, what you do is you establish an invariant in the constructor and tear it down if necessary in the destructor. Fine. And if you don't need a destructor, well, don't write one. Now, um, where do we then use pointers? We use them as references and iterators. So we don't use them to represent ownership. We use them to refer to objects that are owned by somebody. Every object should have a, uh, an owner. And this leaves one problem. This problem has been there for a long time in the C++ community. People tend to want to return a lot of stuff from a function to its caller, like make something, like make a shape, make a matrix of uh, 100,000 elements, some things like that. You tend to use new to put it over on the free store and then return a pointer. And the minute you do that, all the problems with pointers come back. They, you have to decide who is in charge of the object. Is it the creator of the pointer or is it user of the pointer? If I share the pointer, how do I know who I shared it with? You basically can't solve those problems. So let's, let's deal with this. Uh, we've always been able to deal with it. A lot of these things are not new. A lot of these things are not original, but we have easier ways of doing them now, and that's important. It makes it easier for sort of the, 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 the mythical average programmer uh, to deal with it. So let's consider where this picture happens, the idea that you make a big thing and you need to pass it out of a function. My examples with the gadget and such all worked within a single scope. Now we're talking about communicating between scopes. So there's limits to what I can do with scopes. And this happens with factory functions, functions that make things, and functions returning lots of objects, containers, and things like that. So let's take a classical example, take an operator plus on matrices. A matrix could be big, right? So I take in two matrices, and I'm supposed to return a matrix that's the sum of the others. So make a new matrix, fill it up with the good stuff, and return it back. Now, the matrix may be 100,000 by 100,000 doubles. So even on a modern architecture, you can tell that you probably shouldn't copy it on the way back. So let's try and return a pointer. That's actually not such a bright idea. We get the pointer problems, but it also looks ugly. Uh, I, I want to deal with matrices, not pointers to matrices, and I don't want to go around dereferencing uh, uh, matrices to get the result. And apart from that, how many of you spotted the bug before I now pointed it out to you? There's a bug right there. This should not compile in any decent program, and it won't. So anyway, people say they like references better than uh, pointers, so let's try this. We, we pass in references, after all, by pass by reference, that's good. Let's try and return by reference. Now this code uh, looks nice, uh, except who deletes the object? Who, who, who says delete to the pointer? Well, which pointer, where is it? It's, I've hidden the problem. That doesn't mean that the problem went away. This is almost certain to leak even faster than the examples I've shown before. Um, then people have solved this by saying, okay, so an add operation for um, matrices, something that generates big objects, should take its arguments by reference and return its argument by reference. Now you have to set up a target and then uh, program against it. Now we are regressing to assembly code. We just lost 300 years of experience of how to write down math and related things. Uh, I, I, I really don't like that. This, this works in places. A lot of this works. Just like dealing with the pointers directly, it works if you have enough time to deal with it and your programs are simple enough. But often they aren't. So we have to deal with it. And the obvious thing is that if you are making a new object, you should return a new object, right? The plus operation says, make me a vector where the elements are the sums of the elements of my arguments. So I have to return a, um, a, a matrix. The problem is that the semantics of returning 
is the semantics of copying. Sometimes uh, uh, compilers can figure out how to optimize that, but it's not guaranteed. Uh, so what we do here is that we return uh, 10 million uh, elements, and it's painful. So we try and do tricks. Uh, and these tricks, by and large, are non-general and, tr uh, and tricky, brittle. That's not good. So what we should do is something else. And the, the key here is something that we all learned when we were about six months old. Right, here's an object here. Now it's over here. There's nothing there. It's as simple as that. Now, only a computer scientist could get the idea that to get this one over there, we make a copy of it, put it over there, and then destroy the original. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense, right? But that's what people have more or less been doing for a long time, or they built some handle to this one and moves the handle over there, leaving the original in place, or some other complicated stuff. We need to have something really simple. And the really simple looks like this. OK, very naive. I want a matrix that is a sum of the, uh, that has elements that are the sum of the two things, and then I return it. That code should work. And we can make it work because we can, make, we can simply steal the representation. I make R. It's there. It's filled with all kinds of good stuff. I want it over there. So what I do is I take this point, I put it over there, and make this one point to nothing so that when the destructor comes and cleans up the mess, there is basically no mess to clean up. And as I mentioned, there have been compilers over the last 20 years that could do this kind of trickery by themselves because it was an optimized version, but here I'm not relying on any optimization. So we are moving the matrix by doing two word copies to copy the pointer. And if the optimizer works, we can get rid of that copy too, because, well, that can be optimized away. Um, anyway, so this is dirt cheap. And uh, the way that code is done is we write what's called a move constructor. We have constructors that construct things from basically arbitrary things. We have copy constructors that define what copy means. We have move destructors that uh, uh, defines what move means. Uh, this notation here in the best C style is cryptic, and uh, uh, that means a move constructor. And so basically, copy the representation, set the representation to nothing. This is it. Now this code works. And it's efficient, even if there's 10 million elements here. So that is actually very simple. And by the way, you don't have to write all of these constructors yourself. If you if your representation knows how to copy and move, so do you. The language will uh, generate the constructors and destructors for you. So if I defined a matrix as a vector of doubles, that's the elements. And by the way, the vector of doubles, of course, knows how many doubles it contains. Then I don't have to write any more code. Because if you move a matrix, you move its representation, which is the elements, which knows how to move and you're finished. This code here is efficient uh, and leak-proof, exception-proof, and uh, dramatically simpler than some of the code we've seen over the last many years. OK, that's it. So here's my comment about garbage collection. Uh, the garbage collection is neither general nor, uh, nor ideal. It is not general because uh, it only takes care of memory, and a lot of my resources are not memory. And it's not ideal because it imposes a, a shared resource on the system. So uh, some of the old uh, Sun servers, had you could get them with 64 processors. And a lot of the time, 63 of the processors sits waiting for the 64th to garbage collect. We're better today. Uh, somewhat better, but it's still fundamentally a shared resource in a distributed world where uh, we, we, we don't actually need to impose sharing. So I, uh, you, you may have heard of the notion of false sharing. Um, there's an equivalent for garbage collection. So what do you do? Keep your data in containers, like that matrix or that vector or that uh, map or that hash table or something like that. 
and uh, manage it with RAII, uh, the constructor, destructor uh, stuff I showed you. Use move constructors so they are essentially free to move around. Copy constructors when you want to copy. Use smart pointers if you need pointer semantics. When do you do that? Say, take the old shape example. If I want a pointer to the interface class shape, and I can uh, deal with pointers to circles and triangles and heaven knows what, um, you, you just use smart pointers. If you are the only owner and you just want to pass it around, you can use your unique pointer. If you are using a shared pointer, if you're sharing this, the, the object so that you don't know who's responsible for deleting it, you use a shared pointer. I mean, when would you need a shared pointer? A classical example is that you uh, pass some data to three or a dozen uh, tasks that runs in, uh, in parallel. Uh, hopefully for you, uh, you either have some locking mechanism or you have pass a, a pointer to const. Uh, and now the last of these threads, task, uh, concurrent tasks, is supposed to clean out and, 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 and delete um, the, the object pointed to, the shared object. And the shared pointers work really nicely for that. But if all you do is to see the use count go one, two, one, zero, that's not the optimal way. And that's what the way they're actually mostly used in existing code. People use them to pass out information from inside functions. Uh, now, uh, then if you're still leaking, usually for, for old code, uh, you can do what's called litter collection. That is, you ever so infrequently run the garbage collector, like once every day, because there's not that much garbage, so you don't have to run it all the time. And uh, there's a standard interface to that kind of, of collectors. And they actually work rather well if you have a, a lot of old code that you can't convert to the, the modern style. So let me show some modern C++ code that sort of illustrates this. Um, here, I want to find all elements in the container C that, uh, that, that has the value V. This is just a, a trivial example, of course. So what I return, I return a vector of pointers to the elements. The value type of a container is the type of the elements. And so the way I write this function, obviously, is make myself a container to hold the, the things that match. And then for all x in c, if it's a match, push back its uh, address. And uh, I'm using a fair number of new C++ features here. Uh, there's auto that says find the type statically from the element, uh, from its initializer. And so obviously this is the element type of uh, the container. Uh, I pass things by reference here. I don't want to have copies. Um, and then I return by value. And now I can write things like this. Barry had a little lamb. Uh, for all p, uh, all pointers in, uh, that comes back from find all, test that I actually um, got, got the right thing back. Um, it's a little test program that just tests the sanity of this. But the point being, it, it may not look like the C++ you're used to. Uh, in C++ 98, there's a major performance bug right there. But fortunately, you can't write it in C++ 98 because I uh, loaded it up with a few C++ 11 features. If I'm going to use um, move semantics, I am definitely loading up the program with a few explicit features so that it breaks if you try and compile it with a C++ um, 98 compiler. I'll much rather my code breaks than to get a performance bug uh, that you might get there. OK, let's look at object-oriented programming. I'm going to be brief here, because you all probably know it better than I do. So here's the good old shape example. Uh, here, except that I take a vector of unique pointers to shapes. So this is a classical example of where you want a polymorphic pointer. I uh, load the vector up with a couple of objects, which I create using make unique. It says, make me a circle and give me back a, a unique uh, pointer. OK, note, note the absence of news. Note the absence of uh, raw pointers that are just the representation of the address in memory. And now I said draw them all. I go for all of them and call draw. 
I, I will get back to what a drawable sequence is later. Um, so that, that's fairly simple, and it is the classical object-oriented example, except that this one here is, is fairly brief and it doesn't leak at all. Um, of course, a shape looks the way it has done for a long time, borrowed the word virtual from the similar guys that invented the mechanism, and I, just as I borrowed the word um, uh, class from them, um, why it isn't called type, well, it was similar was invented by mathematicians, and it seemed natural to them. Um, and then the only thing that's new here is that you can be explicit about overriding. You want to say there must be a draw with this type. It takes no argument, returns a void in the base class for me to override so I get some checking. It's just slight little uh, refinement that some people like. Um, you don't have to do it if you don't like it. The protection model is public, protected, and private. Uh, beware of uh, protected. It will cause bugs for you if you use it for data. There are people who think it is really cool because it allows anybody to molest my data. Uh, sorry, uh, there's usually ex a different explanation, but that's what it is. You open the, um, the, the, the representation to be modified later. It makes it really hard to have an invariant. So this one here is for functions only. We have multiple inheritance. So does, of course, every language that provides a static interface. It's just that they only provide interface inheritance. We have implementation inheritance, too. We can discuss that if you want. But we, we need at least interface inheritance, uh, inheritance of abstract classes. That class is abstract. It has no uh, full implementation. There's a minimal runtime type identification. We have not gone into the uh, sort of the serious uh, reflection kind of world. Okay, so object-oriented programming inheritance is great when you have hierarchical um, concepts in your domain. That's why it is so nice with the shape example because obviously a uh, smiley face is a circle that's a shape or something like that. Um, you, you can get into trouble even then, but basically it's uh, if you have a domain where you have hierarchical relationships, uh, it, it works fine. Uh, the indirect function calls, the virtual functions, are fairly cheap. I have been told by measurements recently that this figure is too high. Uh, that is, it's closer to, um, to zero overhead than, than before. If you call it a few times, the branch predictors have been improving. Uh, dramatically, so I am actually being pessimistic here. But the main problem is it doesn't um, doesn't inline well. If the operation you want to pass along is, is, is something really simple, you don't get inlining. And in high performance uh, uses, that's important. And anyway, you tend to use allocation, deallocation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is pretty good, though you do get, do get greater coupling between programs uh, parts. You can mitigate that by having uh, better interfaces, abstract base classes, but basically inheritance is seriously and systematically all used and misused. There are people who think good programming means object-oriented programming, and object-oriented programming means use of enormous hierarchies. Certainly the first part of that statement is wrong. There's lots of uh, good code that are not object-oriented, and there's lots of lousy code that are object-oriented by that definition. Um, okay, so uh, that said, I'll go on to the next thing, which is generic programming, which has been uh, wildly popular and successful in the last sort of uh, 10, 15 years. So let's look at that. Um, I'd like to point out that the first paper I ever wrote on C with classes, C++'s uh, uh, predecessor, uh, included generic programming. And I explained why I really wanted a vector of t where t was a parameter, and I really wanted operations of vector of t's that had t as a parameter. I mean, if I have a vector of t's, I want to sort a vector of t's. I don't want to, uh, to fix t uh, arbitrarily for operations. So I wanted that. And I wrote blithely that um, you could do that with macros. 
that did not scale. It's a lousy solution. Uh, in 87 or so, I decided that we needed something better. We needed something extremely general and flexible. I never trusted the science that could only do what I imagined. And I wanted zero overhead because I wanted to put C arrays out of business if I could. The C array is my least favorite data structure. It is the ideal structure for uh, accessing memory directly. But most of the time, that's not what we want. Um, C arrays has a tendency of losing their, their uh, size. I mean, with the slightest excuse, an array turns into a pointer to one or more elements. Actually, it turns into a point. Yes, that's what it does, one or more elements. Except that other pointers can, can refer to zero or more elements. This, this is the source of a lot of problems. So basically, I wanted to compete with that because I wanted data structures that, for starters, did not uh, convert to pointers and remembered their size. And then I wanted well-specified interfaces. I pointed out one of the very first things I did with, with, with C++, with C, when I built C++, was write better type checking. So obviously, I wanted interface uh, checking for, for this. And I looked at it. And at the time, nobody knew how to do those three. And I couldn't figure out how to do it. Given the constraints of my overall problem, I had to pick the two first. And you know, two out of three ain't bad. But it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel right. And so I've been trying to solve that uh, ever since. And I actually do have a solution, which I'm going to show you in, in, in not too great detail. But let's uh, first see how uh, templates have worked up till now. Uh, you can write yourself, you can parameterize a type, then you can parameterize an algorithm with a type, and most of the time you have to be explicit about the uh, type of a type, sorry, the, the parameter to a type. You don't have to be it for a, um, for a use of that type. You simply deduce what T is. If that V happens to be a vector of integers, obviously the T that parameterize sort can be implicit and is, it'll be a sort of integers. If it's a vector of strings, it will be a vector, uh, it'll sort strings, fine. Um, what you can do here is anything that you, uh, you, you, you can call it uh, compile time duck typing. Duck typing is a general principle that if it walks like a duck and it quacks, it's a duck. In other words, you just use the argument type and if it worked, it worked. And if it didn't work, you get an error message. The only good thing about the error messages you get is you get it at compile or link time before the program gets shipped to a customer. Uh, the bad news is that these error messages can be spectacularly bad. Uh, my, my best example recently was I had a seven-line program that used one little um, parameterized class, and I was, on a, I was using SigWin on a Windows machine, and I never figured out what the first few pages of the error messages was because it blew my uh, Windows buffer, uh, SigWin bu uh, window buffer. Uh, then I tried another compiler, and I got the same result, except that the error messages were totally different. And it had nothing to do with the code I wrote that was in any way obvious. So we really should deal with this. So I'm trying. First of all, let's see. We, we need, what we have found is that people write compile time programs. And they have really good reasons for it. Um, mostly performance, but also uh, to express things as directly as possible. Uh, why delay to runtime what you can do at at compile time, so you get your errors and things like that. So people have been doing this. And so like any new feature that's sort of cool, powerful, um, expressive, efficient, it gets overused. And there's been serious overuse. In particular, people write template metaprogramming to compute values. C++11 provides you the ability to write functions at, that's executed at compile time, which take care of some of the worst abuses of, of templates. 
Um, I'll get to other ways of improving that in a second. But first, I'll show those of you who haven't seen all that much C++ what the code looks like. We can parameterize uh, data types with uh, integers, and uh, we can parameterize algorithms with that. So I can sort the vector of integers here, and I can find the uh, or find my hometown in a list of um, of, of uh, strings. And the usual way we deal with uh, returning a failure is to return the end. If I'm looking through a list for something and I found the end instead of uh, what I was looking for, that's the way it is. So we can write code like this. We parameterize an element type and container type. Uh, I could also do the find in the vector of integers. So it's, it's generic code. And that's part of the, the, the appeal of this. Um, we can also parameterize on, on criteria, actions, algorithms. So here I want to have a find something that not, not really is equal to something, but has a property here. We write uh, a, a predicate. Is, is it less than Griffin? And it's strings, so that's, that's meaningful. Uh, and basically, that is done by doing what's known as function object. You write a little class that can hold state so that you use in your operation. And when you can construct it, of course, everything has constructors. And uh, there is an application operator that is invoked to call it. And it'll do something. In this case, it compares to S. And of course, there's a destructor here to clean up that string that we gave it. It has to disappear. And so you can write code like this once you have the less than. And this, people find it a bit of a nuisance to write all of that. It's all of five lines, but uh, sometimes that's too much for people. So you can use what's called a lambda expression that basically writes the code for you. So now we can uh, compare using, compare a string compared to Griffin. Um, lots of languages have these these days. OK. Um, this is the code that, that you write to implement this. If you think C code is beautiful, this is beautiful. If you don't think it, well, this is what you've got anyway. And uh, it very closely models what is being done in the machine. So, uh, and it generates very nice code, whether it is a list or a vector or a, a C array or something like that. So this is the way the code is done. And uh, if you get tired of writing those sequences, uh, like, where, where did you have a sequence? Yeah, from the beginning to the end. That's the way it's expressed. Uh, and that's the most general form, because now you can sort half a sequence or a quarter of a sequence and things like that. It composes very nicely. But it is a nuisance, because the most common case is to do a whole sequence. So you can do this. Uh, sort the sequence using the predicate p, and then I simply say use the standard source from the beginning to the end using p as a predicate. So you can easily uh, write a simpler form of code so that your code uh, shrinks. It'll still execute at exactly the same speed. So um, those of you who are used to C++ will know this is straight code, so that's not a problem. But basically, um, we, we're working on the third part of the definition of templates. How do we specify the interface to a template? How do we specify the requirements that a template has on its arguments? And the way we, we're doing it, we're saying doc typing just isn't enough. We want to state the intent. In other words, we want to specify a template's requirements on its arguments. And basically, the programmer always knows that. I mean, you can't get working code of, that's templatized unless you have a good idea about what requirements there are. What, is this, what are the template, the actual template argument supposed to do for you? I mean, if I'm having a matrix of numbers, uh, I want numbers. If I'm having a vector of elements, they have to have the property of an element. 
An element can be copied. You can take its address and things like that. The number is something you can add, multiply, or something like that. So you know it already. It's just there's been no way of saying it. So what we can say here, in a container, for sort, I want my, the type container, cont, to be sortable. And what's sortable? It's a predicate. It's a predicate you apply. It's either true or false for a given type. I apply sortable to a vector. And it'll say something like, hmm, do you have random access? Is there something you can do random access to? And do you have an element type? And can the elements of that type be compared, um, in this case, using less than, which is the default? So that's what the sortable uh, does. And it will, if you look it up, be about three lines of code that says in code just what I uh, do. And today, I actually uh, write code in C++11. I put a comment there. And I use this simply as my uh, shorthand for writing good requirements. I have a set of uh, co concepts so I can uh, provide the, um, the, the specification in a concise way. And in C++14, the concepts that are coming there, this will be code. So um, we can also have some, some notation here. As, uh, if I want a sort of sortable, it means that I want, I can write it's a, a sortable type S that you're sorting, which means that there has to be a type that is sortable, and I pass that. So it's just a shorthand. And you can use that for lambdas, too. I can say I want a lambda that work for sortable C. So uh, a container C. So it all works out. And now, uh, let's see how it works. I have here the template of sortable container. That's fine. It's not quite the densest uh, notation we've got, but it's pretty much. No, there should be a type that's sortable, and that's the type of my container. I make myself a vector of doubles. I make myself a list of integers. I sort the vector. Everything's fine. What happens here is that it says, hmm, is vector of double a container? Yeah, I can have random access. I can uh, have random access. It has an element type I can compare. It's fine. Sort the list. I is it a random access uh, iterator? No, it's not. It, it, you only have, uh, uh, you can only search through a list. You can't access the nth element directly. So the actual error message coming out here, list of integer does not satisfy the constraint of sortable. So those of you who have suffered from the template definitions of the last 15 years, I'm sorry, I didn't know how to do that then. Now we do. Um, there is an implementation of this stuff. It's a branch of GCC. Look up concepts, Andrew Sutton, and you can find it and try and play with it. Uh, if you switch, uh, if you uh, throw one of the compiled switches, it'll then tell you why list of int does not satisfy sortable, and it'll come back and says uh, list of int is not sortable because it doesn't have a subscript operator. That's simple. Uh, the, if you get the extra information, it'll be about four lines, as opposed to pages. And uh, yeah, that's what I said. So uh, back to, to something that uh, seems obvious, but certainly is not what has been obvious in the C, C++ and many other communities for a long time. Generic programming is just programming. Um, there are people develop strange theories and complicated theories about how you write templates and you use a different kind of logic when you're writing template programming and people invent very complicated ways of doing it. But let's look at some code. Here is a square root function like we learned about on the first day of our um, programming, uh, when we learned programming, right? We can give it something that can be used as a double, like an integer, and everything's fine. And the function gets called. It takes and gives you back the square root of, um, of x. And uh, assuming that you know what a square root is, you don't have to look into the implementation. It just gets called. If you give it a square root of something that isn't a double, can't be made into a double, like the address of a double, you get an error message that says square root wants a double. Now let's try that with a container. We take a container, we give it to the container, 
and it says everything's fine because a vector of string is a container and it's a sortable and whatever, uh, it works. Give it something that's not a vector, it says no, um, sort wants a vector and the address of a vector is not a vector. So we can get back to a, a world where the code actually looks very similar whether it is generic or not. And I don't think we have to learn significantly new concepts. Uh, we just have to get back to, to, to what we learned about on the first day of our programming course. Um, writing the templates is a little bit harder, but not much harder, and it's significantly easier than it, it is today. Um, this this led me into one of my favorite rants, which is that uh, the distinction uh, between these so-called paradigms are uh, more or less a function of uh, the language features people have had available. Um, people have huge discussions about should you do conventional C-style programming, do you use uh, object-oriented programming, putting things in hierarchies, or should you parameterize and use generic programming? Um, I think this is a function of, uh, of, of poor uh, language support and the, um, the, the, the discussions do harm. So here is the classical example of, um, of an object-oriented programming written in a, in a slightly different style. So I am drawing all containers for which the value type is shape, and I do that by calling the for each uh, algorithm for the container using the lambda that draws the shapes. Um, my point here is not, it may not be your ideal draw all, but it's, it's pretty good. I, I can actually do it slightly better, but this is, this, this is to make the point. Obviously, this is object-oriented code. I'm doing runtime polymorphism on a class hierarchy of shapes. Um, is it generic code? Obviously, that container is a parameterized type and actually draw all is parameterized on the container type and the element type of the container. You go in here, this is perfectly ordinary code. It uh, called a for each algorithm uh, on a container using a lambda. Uh, we're certainly borrowing uh, styles from the functional programming world where they have been very useful. So uh, do me a favor, don't get into language wars or paradigms. I think the word paradigm was seriously uh, misdefined uh, by Kuhn when he first came, it. He came with it. It was this idea that there is a paradigm, then you get another paradigm, the first one gets totally useless, shouldn't be used anymore, the old guy should die off and the world would be much better for it. Um, he used as an example Newton's world and Einstein's world, but you know, we still live in Newton's world most of the time and most of the calculations defined by Newton still works. Yes, you need gravitational uh, Einstein logic to deal with the uh, high precision GPS, but that's very rare. Similarly, uh, Christ Nugor, who invented uh, object-oriented programming, uh, had the same kind of attitude to paradigm. He, he used to talk about in the old days we had plus and minus, and that was what we had. And then somebody invented multiplication and division. Now, this is a new paradigm, so clearly you have to get rid of the old paradigm. No more plus and minus, that's old fashioned. And you can write everything you like with, um, with, um, with multiply and divide. Well, I do wonder how people get negative numbers in that world, but apart from that, I think it's absurd. The old ways sometimes are still simply absorbed in the new stuff, and we can do more and we can do it better. So, that's it. So challenges. Uh, basically, uh, I'm not claiming C++ is, is, is perfect. We uh, have to see what we, we can do to make it better. Uh, we have to make programmers actually prefer modern code for um, the kind of applications, the kind of things C++ is good at. So I want the code, like I showed it you, to be used on close to the hardware high-performance uh, code because it works, and it works better than uh, the old code. The unique pointer runs exactly as fast. So the last cycle 
that well-written code with a raw pointer and proper deletes. The sort algorithm here blows away a CQ, CQ sort by factors, not percent. So you can afford it, but we have to convince people to, to do it. And then we need to make C++ a better language under the constraints that it still has to be the best language for uh, really low-level code and abstraction above that. that that's the aim. And uh, we, we, uh, that's important. And we have compatibility, performance, portability, range of application areas. We cannot improve the language just by making it a, a, a domain-specific language. That, that again, would, would violate some of the ground rules. And uh, there's some more information. There's a new website, more or less new website, isocpp.org, that will offer you uh, access to a variety of information, including about the standards and et cetera, stuff that floats by. There are some books and a website by me. I'm especially proud of this little book, a Tour of C++. It explains all of C++ in 180 pages. Um, of course, I have to leave out some details. It's, uh, <laughs> it's at a reasonably high level, but there's lots and lots of code. And so that's a 180-page uh, uh, version. That's what you can read on a long train or plane journey. And the rest is details. Well, there are, uh, let's see, uh, 1,300 uh, pages of uh, details in that book. Same number of uh, details, even more details, and 1,300 pages in the standard. And that's encrypted in standard D's to stop you from reading it. Um, I, I did not invent the rules for the ISO standards, but they, they can be pretty gross. But if you want to know everything about C++, search for WG21, which is the official name of the Standards Committee. I told you Standard D's encrypts everything, including the name of the Standards Committee. Uh, and you can find the standard. You can find every committee doc document. It's, it's public and available. And then, basically, I will switch to questions and answers. Thank you. So I'm sure after that masterclass, there'll be just one or two questions. Um, it can be anything from a, a technical question or something broader and more general, just about Bjorn's experiences in, in general. So if I can throw it out to you, and we've got a couple of roving mics, we'll get to you as quickly as possible. If you can introduce yourself and fire away with your question. One of the things you put next to the um, C++ elephant was buffer overflow. And in the wake of Heartbleed, I saw a tweet circulating around which said, every security bug you've ever faced was Dennis Ritchie's fault. Um, so I want to say is, do you want to claim any of the credit? <laughs> and what do you think the way forward is to avoid things like Heartblade? Yeah, Let, let's say it this way. We shouldn't be rude to Dennis Ritchie. He was the guy who more than anybody else lifted the level of programming from assembly code to a higher level notation. And for that, he deserves a lot of credit. And if we have to blame somebody, it should be the people who still write code, as Dennis Ritchie did in 1973. Um, now, I haven't had a buffer overflow in a long time. And the reason is that I actually only use the C arrays uh, directly if I am doing a hardware uh, operating system load and store. Everything else, I use a vector, and I have the size sitting right there. If I write a loop, the easiest way to write the code is to ask for the size and use it. And for that reason, buffer overflows doesn't really happen in my code anymore. And if people used vectors and containers and such, that would be very, very common. It's a similar thing that uh, I could have put, put uh, uh, memory, um, I mean, SecFort or something on that list. Um, and again, it, it just doesn't happen unless you are using pointers in a, in a fairly silly way. 
And again, you don't have to do that anymore. You use the containers that has access operations. Uh, you use the uh, smart pointers so that uh, they actually point to something as opposed to, to nothing. And so these problems are by and large gone. Um, by and large, it's probably not uh, good enough for, for some people's taste, but it's better than the, 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 the C model here. Um, I know that processors uh, from Intel at least will come with hardware support for range checking um, in, I think, next year. It has been uh, announced, and I expect the C++ compilers will then take what is currently undefined, which is accessing outside the array, um, and enforce it by hardware so that um, it's dirt cheap. Um, there's a, uh, you, you, can, you can do that. And I would like to build a completely type safe system around this at the runtime speeds we've got. Uh, I think it can be done provided you provide a loophole when you're accessing hardware and operating system resources directly and, and, and basically declaring that some code is trusted. And beyond that, you can be fully type safe. I haven't done it yet, so it hasn't been proven. But for me personally, that problem is in the past by several years. And it could be in, in yours too, if, if you can move to the modern world. Eric Thomas, University of Edinburgh. It seems that um, one of the hardest things about C++ is accessibility to uh, large projects for new developers. So if you're a new developer and you approach a project with lots of metaprogramming, with uh, templates inheriting from classes, inher inheriting from templates and so forth, it's really hard to figure out the flow of execution through the program and the way the data moves through the program. Uh, so first question, do you also think this is a problem? And second question, do you have any ideas of helping new developers get into a project? Yeah. C++ is obviously too complex, and it has all these barnacles from its history. And if you get a project where people have gone hog wild on, um, on templates, or on class hierarchies, or on using C pointers, you have a major problem on your hands. Um, you can write bad code in, in uh, lots of languages, and in C++ you can even do it in many separate ways. Um, I think there's a major problem in the education where people, a lot of professors insist teaching you the bad ways of doing things first, and a lot of them never gets to the good ways. Because after all, they had to suffer to learn C, so why shouldn't you? <laughs> uh, probably builds character. Uh, so I think partly it's an education system, uh, education problem, and I'm trying to address that with some of the books I show. Partly, it's the fact that if you are attacking a million line um, code base, uh, it's going to be have been written over years. It's going to have different styles in it. Um, we need uh, better tools for upgrading and for understanding it. It's it's actually coming, especially in the Clang world, where you can where, where they have a pretty good static analyzers. Uh, Coverity has been doing it for a while, but a lot of people don't use them because it costs money. They rather waste their own time and money than, than pay others for solving the problems. Um, and uh, there will be much more coming out of Clang later this year, I know. So I have some hope that static analysis will help you and that, um, that, static, uh, that code transformation will become common to simplify code. Now, for the specific problem of our template metaprogramming, I have been encouraging people all the time to not do things as complicated as they can. There's the old saying, if you're writing the code as complicated as you can handle, you can't maintain it because you just did the best you could and now you have to find the bug. So my guess is that if, if you really have the truly horrendous template metaprogramming you should probably back it out. And with concepts, you can eliminate some template metaprograms by simply writing them simpler. 
And by const extra functions, you can eliminate essentially every template metaprogram that generates a value by writing ordinary code. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I think there's another question somewhere up here. Hi, uh, my name's Dan. Um, I work at Neo. Uh, my question is about uh, compile times. One of the things I've heard people say they suffer with but with C and C++ is fairly long compile times. And I believe one of the things that was cited as a potential reason for it was uh, look, repeated rereading of headers, things like that. So I wondered, do you, can you see if there, if, is there anything that you think could be done in terms of language de design rather, uh, improvements rather than just compiler optimization that could improve the situation? Um, that's a very tricky question that we have been trying to deal with for years. Um, there are languages that are even slower at compiling, but I'll be polite and not mention them. Uh, on the other hand, we all suffer from long compile times. And there actually is work going on to doing that with um, a fairly simple module system put in place so that you don't do repeated uh, co compiles of the same header file. I mean, if you include the same header file in 100 uh, source files, you get to compile it 100 times. And there are people that do much worse than that. Um, it is being developed primarily at Apple and Google. It is in use uh, for C, Objective-C, and C++. Um, I expect to hear much more about it quite soon. There is a study group in the Standards Committee uh, called Modules, where you can go and look at, at uh, what they've got. They're not very good at publishing early, but there are documents that describe it. I expect to see um, at least initial beta releases widely available uh, next year. The two organizations I mentioned are not the only one that's interested and are not the only ones that are working on that. So it will not be solved for C++14, but I expect to it to be solved by C++17 and be available uh, in major compilers, notably Clang, um, much sooner than that. Do you have maybe some statistics, or do you know about the trends for programmers moving from older standards to C++11, or maybe the newer one, how eager they are to do that? Because, um, sorry, uh, like C++11, it's here for a few years already, and I haven't been reading a lot of the code that's written in that standard. I just read some older standards code. One of the problems I listed on the challenges is to get people to upgrade and to get them to understand it. And there are a lot of organizations that has code bases that should be compilable by old uh, compilers and therefore they can't move forward. This is very sad and we have to do something about it. I think what we have to do is to point out that the newer coding styles are safer and actually generate faster code. And then we have to back this observation with code analysis and uh, code transformation to rejuvenate code or modernize code, whatever you call it. Uh, that said, there's actually a lot of C++ code around there. There's even C++14 code shipping in products. It's mostly in organizations that has a control of their code base. That is, have a, a unified code base, have a unified uh, check-in procedures as opposed to be fragmented uh, through many user uh, groups. And uh, so you, you find code and something like Google being far more modern than, than the impression you're getting. Uh, the adoption of C++11 has been significantly faster than the adoption was of C++98 even though the problem of moving ahead is obviously larger now because there are more old compilers and more code. 
mean, we are talking about billions of lines of code here. I'm sure uh, you could spend the whole working life never getting out of some of the older styles. Similarly, you could spend your whole working life from now on never seeing any of the older stuff. Uh, it's a huge community. Uh, hello, Vladimir, University of Edinburgh. My question is the following. Um, plain old C is pretty good at maintaining binary compatibility with various modules. However, in C++, that's a bit more challenging and modules compiled with different compilers um, require a bit more work to make them work together. Do you think the current situation is okay or does it need any improvement? It would, be, it would be really nice if you could mix and match code compiled with any compiler of any vintage of C++. Uh, you can't. Uh, the origin of this problem is that every vendor in the 80s and early 90s thought they were going to dominate the world. And everybody would agree to using their linkage standards and their object format. And every vendor uh, tried to improve their uh, linkage formats and their compilers and therefore they, they couldn't agree on a, on a standard. There was an attempt, the Itanium uh, ABI uh, was adopted in some cases. Um, there are some hope for better linkage for the 64-bit uh, architectures, but it is a real problem. Um, think about it this way. If you are a compiler vendor with, say, a billion lines of user code out there from your customers, uh, what are you going to be compatible with? the other guy's compiler or the compiler that you shipped last year. As far as I can see, every vendor, be it open source or not, chooses to maintain compatibility with their previous compiler to the largest possible extent. And when they break compatibility, they don't actually quickly move to something that's compatible with something else. They put in some new optimizations that, that suits them better. So this is a problem. C's compatibility is almost a historical accident because there was um, compilers that was popular on different platforms and people imitated them. With C++, when they put in a C++ compiler, they competed. So I've seen examples where one compiler takes all the implementation defined things and does this to them, and the next one comes along, look at the list and do the exact opposite in almost all the cases. Um, linkage is not standardized. It's not standardized by, for C. It's not standardized for C++. It is a real, real problem. And it's a nuisance, and I don't know what to do about it. Hi. Um, my name is Andrew. I work at Skyscanner. Um, you spoke about uh, the barnacles on C++ to maintain backwards compatibility. Um, have you ever considered writing a completely new language from the ground up um, using concepts that you want in C++ but might not necessarily be able to put in? Uh, and if you did, do you think you'd end up with Java? The, the second part of that question is very easy to answer. No, I wouldn't build something that looked any way like Java. It, it totally... Uh, or uh, emphasizes object-oriented programming and hierarchies, and it uses a garbage collector. And it uses a virtual memory. It's in the way of everything I like about a systems programming language. Um, it's probably fulfilling its own design criteria very well. Uh, C++ doesn't fulfill the uh, Java criteria either. Uh, now, of course, I've dreamt of building a new uh, programming language with uh, a nicer syntax, nicer semantics, nicer properties, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my first guess is that unless you could embed it in the C++ community and infrastructure, it would fail very fast. So it's not an easy thing to do. And Any I'm more questions? Only, I'm not the only one who has wanted to do something like that. But Hi, it's um, very hard. A question 
from up to your right. <laughs> um, just one question. We Where? see more, oh, there. Yeah. We see more system languages on the hardware definition side attempt, well, we see hardware definition languages trying to move up to system level. Um, C++ is obviously operating close to the metal. Do you see C++ moving downwards towards the hardware definition languages at all, or do you think, do you see the hardware definition languages moving up towards C++? Um, I don't know enough about that particular area to be really certain, but I think C++ makes a rather nice um, hardware definition language, especially if you use uh, templates in a fairly moderate uh, way. That way you can write things that, that well, anyway, I, I won't go further than that. Um, I, I don't know enough to, to be sure. Okay. Yeah, I had another question about barnacles. So of the 1,300 pages in the C++ specification, um, about how many pages would you say are barnacles and which ones? <laughs> That's hard. Uh, let me just point out, by the way, that 1,300 pages is also the size of the c -sharp specification <laughs> and of the Java specification plus minus 5%. So it is not specific to C++. Uh, barnacles, um, there, there's some really weird side effects of C uh, in it in places. Um, certainly, I would like the rules for uh, say conversions, not to go both ways. I mean, it's fine to assign a character to a long. It is really si uh, nice to assign a long to a um, char. Though in real code, obviously, people have tested it, so most of the time that's not a problem in existing code. But the type system gets seriously complicated by that kind of stuff. Uh, similarly, um, I, I don't actually, it's nice to have a data type you can do bit operations on and and all, but, but why should that double as an integer? Um, and I really like arrays for dealing with the lowest level of hardware. I don't know how to write a systems programming language that doesn't have something like an array. But why should you be allowed to forget its size? And why should it convert to a pointer of potentially another type when you're, when you're going into class hierarchies. No. So these are sort of the worst barnacles. Then there's some syntactic oddities and so on. But let, let me not go to a, a, through a whole list of these things because they're there. We learn, we have been, I mean, C++, when you take into account C, is more than 40 years old. So you expect some, some barnacles. And, we have tried many times to get rid of them. Deprecating features, uh, options for, for not doing things, doesn't work. The community, when given a choice between getting rid of dangerous old features and not breaking their code, chooses not breaking their code. If you get an Oracle C++ compiler, it'll come with a minus arm option, which says, follow the rules of my draft document for starting the standards process from 1988. A lot has happened since then. But they have not been able to remove that feature because they have paying customers that insist on it. But if I could just ask maybe um, if we could all show our appreciation and thank you very much for the effort and the amount of time you've, you've given. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.